The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Welcome into my state of mind. I am Dan York. It's another one of those check-ins to the school systems. You know, Rhode Island may be 50 miles long and 35 miles wide and feel like we're all in this together oftentimes, but we also know how provincial we can be and how different the school systems are here, say from the city of Providence to some of the rural towns like in Cherahoe. Well, for instance, tonight we will have the new superintendent of the Cherahoe school systems, Gina Picard, who has worked in the Providence school systems for a couple of dozen years, is also a North Providence school committee member, and uh, the new superintendent in Cherahoe, all trying to figure out how to do this in COVID. Here's some background on some of the tough decision dynamics involved with opening the schools. It's a choice every family will have to make, sending children into the classroom or continuing full-time distance learning. The governor and education commissioner announcing in a weekly briefing, if they do return to an in-person education, no one will have to go back into the classroom, at least not initially, announcing parents will have the option to keep their kids home. I believe that that's the right way to do this, which is get, you know, our job is to set it up, have it be safe, have an in-person option, and then give the parents some time to get comfortable rather than saying, if you don't show up, your kid's marked absent. Here's the reality, though. Every school district, in order to have a complete plan, has to have a plan for distance learning. Tom DePaula, executive director of the Rhode Island School Superintendents Association, says he agrees. We knew all along that there was going to have to be a remote or a distance component. And, and the reason for that is there are kids and teachers, but, but kids primarily who may have medical conditions. And we also know that given the circumstances and what we've learned since March, that there will be kids and adults who will have to be quarantined. But Central Falls teacher and parent Stephanie Meewes questions the options for teachers. She helped organize the car rally for a safe return to school. The group is against in-person learning. The fact that teachers are not being offered an option, I don't think it's not what needs to happen, but I think it's not the end of what needs to happen. Other local teachers saying the same. So I feel like it's a good move, but it doesn't help the teachers or school staff who don't have that option. And so as we continue to check in with superintendents uh, across the state, we go from uh, some of the more concentrated populations to some of the suburban towns and then we go into the country you know the Cherahoe school system is now being managed and uh, and superintended by Gina Picard who is new to the job superintendent thank you very much for joining me it's my pleasure Dan so uh, before we get into the nitty-gritties of you know battling COVID and educating kids through the whole thing uh, you ought to talk about your wide experience. You had you had a, a middle school uh, career in the Providence school systems. You're a North Providence school committee person, so you see that side. Of the, only in Rhode Island do you have that kind of a setup, right? Uh, <laughs> but and you're also a mother of three, and you and you've had experience with distance learning. So feel free to take some quality time here and talk to me about your world of education experience and how it's all kind of coming together here in this crazy time. Sure. I've had 23 years of experience for the Providence School System, started my teaching career there, and uh, just left as the executive director of middle schools. Um, definitely bittersweet, lots of great work happening. Um, excited for the superintendent, Peters, to do some good work with the commissioner. Um, but it was time for me to sort of spread my wings, and I took um, a chance and applied to the superintendency of the uh, Charaho Regional School District. and. I was blessed enough by that school committee and the community to be provided this opportunity. So now I'm a new superintendent, started June 18th. And like you said, I'm also, um, I'm in my, I'm running for re-election. Actually, I have no opponent for the first time. So maybe that means I'm doing a great job or it means that people didn't want to do this during COVID. <laughs> but either way, I'm going into my next um, term. So I've done, done that for 12 years, which gives me, I think, a nice lens. And also as a mom of three, one who just graduated high school in the pandemic, which was difficult to, to deal with. I had a fourth grader was going into fifth grade, elementary school aged, and my oldest uh, was a freshman in college. So definitely a lot of experience in different venues. Somebody who's got your experience on the administrative side through education, I'm sure 
you know, we don't know each other, but I'm guessing you bring up the acumen to the table and it must be some exercise to see both sides of the equation. Talk to me about that. Then we'll get into the COVID thing, but I think, I think this advises your, your approach on COVID and the like, doesn't it? It, it really does. I think um, I have a, a unique experience. One, I, I do value the role of school committee and the constituency piece around the tax dollars. I, I'm a taxpayer and um, it's never easy to ask for additional monies. And oftentimes, you know, you hear, um, I work with Mayor Lombardi, so he's no, um, he's someone that most people know about budgeting and he's really, he's really strict around his budgeting, but it, it comes with its share of need. You know, you can't, there's certain things that are difficult to budget for, special education, um, you can't deny services, so you really have to be mindful of the needs of students. But I do believe if we're really thinking about what's best for students and best for our kids, you probably can't make a bad decision. Um, bottom lines can be tough, but that's where you really have to think about the kind of budgeting that you're doing. I'm a fan of the zero-based budgeting. I think it's important that, you know, we don't just, you know, we start from scratch and really think, are we, are we looking at efficiencies? Are, are we doing things better? My lens as an educator allows me to say when someone says, well, I think we need more staff. And I say, show me why. I know how to schedule a building. I was an elementary principal, K through six, with 560 students. So I've scheduled buildings. I've scheduled middle school buildings of 1,000. So I'm pretty good at looking at efficiencies and determining the number of staff necessary, the number of caseloads. Um, but I, we have also done negotiations with teachers union. I, I sit on that committee as well for the last um, three or four contracts now. And some were really difficult. When I started my career as school committee person, my first meeting was with Ernie Almonte uh, and they were, North Providence was not in a good place. Let's say that. Right. There was a lot of work to be done there and uh, not a great, not great for morale because you go in and then you take a lot. And um, my first contract, I mean, we, we got back $6 million for the taxpayers. Now, it didn't make many friends on that one, but definitely needed changes had to happen. And the teachers, you know, while it was a struggle, I think now they realize uh, the community is better situated to be more thoughtful about teacher raises because we're, we're more efficient in other areas. Yeah, so, well, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. I talked to you all day about, about that side of it. When we come back, Gina Picard, the new superintendent in the Cherry Hill School System, which of course is, you know, it's Hopkinton, it's Charlestown, and Richmond, correct? Yes. Those three yep. towns. C H Charlestown, Richmond, Hopkinton. There you go. Uh, so she's a Rhode Islander who has to make the long commute, you know, <laughs> it's actually probably less than it was from Providence to North Providence and, and on a traffic day. But anyway, when we come back, we'll, we'll talk about um, the uniqueness of grabbing the reins in June while, you know, what's hitting the fan all over the place here. We'll be right back on Dan York State of Mind with the chair host superintendent. Please stay with us. Back to my state of mind, I am Dan York. Gina Picard is the superintendent of schools in the Cherahoe School District and, 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 a, and a current member of the North Providence School Committee. So she's got uh, an understanding of both sides in her two dozen years in the Providence School System managing the, the middle school uh, uh, part of the equation. Uh, pretty, pretty good resource for us to check on this thing. What's your, um, well, to tell me this. What was your Providence experience like trying to manage the middle schools through what was a hellacious first or last couple of first couple of months of COVID last couple of months of the school year? How, how tough was it? Well, I think uh, right before we all jumped into distance learning, I think that week we all were trying to figure out how in the world we were going to make this happen. And it seemed almost impossible. But um, I have to say, you know, coming together with the teachers during that one week and the principals and the assistant principals and our teaching and learning teams, we, like many other districts, Chiroho included, flipped that switch pretty quickly. And, you know, we met every single day. So I had a meeting at 3.30 every day with my administrators to talk about what's going well, what's not going well, what do you need? Um, what are you hearing and really trying to mitigate all of that to ensure that we would get better and improve every single time. We really uh, were mindful of the importance of communication to families. It was very stressful. I mean, you went from students in, in like, for example, in Chariho, they were one-to-one -one grades um, 
five through 12, five and grades five through eight all have Chromebooks and grades nine through 12 all get Macs. And our youngest uh, in elementary school, where they were two to one. So they were much more situated for this uh, ability to be able to go distance learning. Um, where in Providence, the only school that was really one-to-one -one in, in a really strong way was Del Sesto, but West Broadway was also there. And they um, were able to think through their websites to ensure that parents had the exact communication necessary. Teachers making phone calls every day, talking with uh, their students via Zoom, which was new, and then the whole Zoom, you know, popping in and out, and we had to put more restrictions on that. But it really pushed people's technical abilities, and you saw very firsthand who was savvy and who needed a little, a little bit more support. So as a district, we had to increase professional development with those tools, and they were packed. We had to continue to increase those opportunities because they were filling up faster than we could put them up. Did you? Uh, it's hard to put your. It's hard to put you know, a hard answer to, to this question, but I, I asked Craig Levis, the uh, Coventry superintendent about this earlier. He gave me a kind of a unique answer. Uh, we, are you able to assess either from Providence or Cherahoe or even North Providence for that matter, the gap that exists between what was the stated goal of, you know, keeping the pedal to the metal and, 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 and pursuing results that would have been pre-COVID in nature and the actual execution of it. How, you know, how far, how, how close do you think you came to finishing the school year, for lack of a better term, normally standard? I think we tried. I think it was a challenge. I'm not going to make any stories. I think some students we saw flourish and others just found it difficult. And I think the, the social emotional well-being of some students was a concern, you know, not seeing their friends, feeling this uh, isolation. Families who um, had more than one student at home uh, with younger um, children, especially kindergarten, parents not having that ability to understand really the support, really feeling a, the struggle of trying to get the five-year-old to attend to a screen. It's a novelty at first. And then they're like, they're all set with that. Um, there are definitely certain populations that struggled. Multilingual learners, uh, differently able population, younger learners, pre-K, K-1. It's a struggle. And I think while every teacher did their very, very best, uh, it was not an easy uh, not an easy thing to handle. My child is, I saw, you know, some days she was done very, very quickly. And, you know, and as a parent, I was an elementary teacher and I happened to be a fourth grade teacher once. So I could do things that other families wouldn't have access to sometimes. And I think that's where we, uh, we focus on equity and really was it equitable for all or is it the haves and the have nots? I, I guess I'm asking an impossible question. Like you don't really know. Right. I mean, you don't I mean, you know how hard you tried and you know how 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 cooperative the teachers were and the union stuff didn't really get a lot in the way. And it was good. But you really don't know. And so if you really don't know how in heaven's name do you start a new school year? The, the COVID logistics being one thing academically, where do you start like you normally would curriculum wise? Well, we, we're looking at what we call power standards, the most important you know, standards within that grade level. We're talking with our teachers and with our school improvement teams that also have parents that sit on them and really working with our teaching and learning subcommittee to think through how do you measure that gap? How do you measure progress? Um, and we've done those things before, but what do, you, what do you do when it's virtual? So we're really thinking about the kinds of assessing we can do. Formative, which means those checks for understanding. I always say formative is like, you're a coach at a basketball game. The play doesn't run the way you're supposed to run it. You call a timeout, bring it back. That's formative assessment. And then you send it back out to do a play. And then the summative really at the end of the week, you know, how do you know students learn? That's the question. How, how, how are these assignments connecting? What's the purpose of that assignment? And is it gonna get to what students need? And I think teachers are, what COVID did was they really thought about what they were placing in front of children. like. What is the purpose of this? Is this really what I need them to focus on? Is how important is this assignment compared to the standard? And it really had teachers thinking very critically about uh, the tools they were using, as well as the kinds of needs students had to accommodate different learners. Oh, that's fascinating. When we come back, the specific logistics that Cherahoe is embarking upon comparative to where the state is and the confidence level, of course, 
the anxiety level that everybody has. We got to Matt. We got to talk about that with uh, Gina Picard, the new chair host, superintendent of schools here on Dan York State of Mind. Stay with us. Welcome back to my state of mind, Dan York, with Gina Picard, the superintendent of schools in Cherro, newly hired in June. All right, lay it out as, as specifically and as quickly as you can. A, are you confident about an August 31st? I would say I'm, I'm not the Department of Health. So what I know is that Charaho is planning for all scenarios and we will be ready to implement any scenario the governor puts forward. I understand that one of the scenarios that seems to be difficult uh, to digest is the AB one, which is, uh, you know, the kids are going to school on Monday, Tuesday, or Tuesday, Thursday, another Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Parents, I guess, are just, oh, no, 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 because parents are looking for some kind of consistency of schedule so they can apply their economic uh, lives to this whole thing. Do you, do you agree that that seems to be a tough one to, to, to do? Well, for us, uh, we did a survey about which kind of partial implementation our parents would prefer. And while they agreed, all of them would be challenging. Let's say that. Um, most of them preferred either the alternate, the alternate week or the AABB day, which is mean Monday, everyone's distance learning. And then a group of students, group one, using the alphabet come uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then the rest of the students are doing distance learning, and then the other group come Thursday, Friday. And um, both were sort of equal for our families. But we asked, and we know that, we know it's, it's going to be, this is not normal. You know, none of us created COVID, and we're all learning how to redesign and rethink what everything looks like. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Are, are you, are you, confident about the virus containment itself i mean how i mean here you are an educator that's got it's got to become like you know a you know a, a medical crisis triage administrator this is this is i mean you becoming a superintendent's uncharted territory for most educators anyway never mind adding this on top of the uh, on top of the mix how confident are you about virus containment well, I think one, we're struggling to get some of the supplies and we had a conversation with the governor on Wednesday and um, they're well aware, I know they're working as the state to get us um, things as, as a, on a whole, but we're all competing. This is not a Rhode Island issue. You know, this is happening across the world. So the things that we need, the governor put together those five metrics and what we're told is if we can't hit all those, then we won't open. So uh, our PPE is coming in, our masks and our uh, hand sanitizer and the cleaning materials, but there are, I'm still waiting on the electric static cleaners. Those are like those Ghostbuster kind of foggers. Those were ordered, um, Chiraho had those ordered back in you know April and there's, every time they're supposed to get delivered, we, hit, we get a new sort of back order. You are so it's really tough. You find, are you uncomfortable with the idea that the governor stuck the August 31st date out there? I mean, I know this, the commissioner was working on it and had it on the board tentatively, but we all now know that the, the, the governor kind of threw that out there and, and even surprised the commissioner with their commitment to that date. Um, are you uncomfortable racing against that clock? I mean, in Massachusetts, they're talking about mid-September, waiting on Washington to, to work out their politics for uh, you know another stimulus package. You know, every day you wait, and you hope that you've got a little bit more virus intel. Uh, tell me about that. You know, I think everyone was surprised, but I also think what the governor is trying to do is provide some hope. And I think it did provide hope for many families. We received many emails that were like, oh, she said, thank, you know, this is happening. Thank goodness. And then on the other hand, 50% said, oh, I don't know what she's doing. Um, this, we're not ready for this. So I think there's this half and half. But I do know that... Um, after having that conversation with her on Wednesday, I do believe that she has the best interest of everyone at heart and that she really is thinking through this with the Department of Health and she was listening. I really found that conversation to be um, where she was hearing our feedback, listening to our struggles, thinking through some of the proposals we wanted to see and um, took that opportunity to make some changes even based on what I heard at, at the press conference on Wednesday. So. I definitely think we're, we're being heard. I also think the metrics are, are allowing us to say, okay, so unless this all happens, we're not gonna open it as a full in-person learning. But I also know I have many families who did want that distance learning option. And that was something that um, the governor asked us about. And we really felt that it, by not providing them that option, you know, was causing more anxiety and stress in families. And 
parents don't even know if it's the right option. They're, you know, go, sending your child to school, not sending a child to school, doing homeschooling, doing distance learning, all of them are difficult decisions. And I don't think um, any superintendent can say this is the right decision, any one of them. It's, I'm gonna go take the guidance from the Department of Health who are the professionals in this field to say, if I can do this, this, and this, I should be able to keep staff and students safe. And if they say yes, and we can do it, then we absolutely will. But um, I'm not someone who would put children or staff at risk. So if I have a concern, I'm gonna put it out there right away. If I didn't think I had enough cleaner sanitizer, I would make sure that um, they understood that before. And I don't think anyone would be at risk. I think that they would know they'd have to listen to that information first. Right, well, that's a, that's a, a very thorough answer. I, and probably the best that you can do uh, at this point. Um, it's fluid. We'll try to check in with you over the course of, of August and see where it goes. Um, final thought, 10, 15 seconds on what kind of a rocky road you guys are looking at here. I think what I'm going to ask everyone is for flexibility. Know that as good as our plan is right now, it needs to get better every day and we need to take feedback. And day one may look different than day three. My intention is to continue to listen to families. We have four virtual forums this week, one next week. Just continue to listen, communicate, and ensure that we're doing what's best for kids every day and can't make a bad decision if you do that. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, uh, I find your thoughts refreshing. Thank you very much. Good luck to you in your first superintendency. Uh, Thank you. I don't know if you're courageous or crazy, uh, but <laughs> uh, probably a little combination of both, right? My goodness. Uh, Gina Picard, the uh, new superintendent at Cherahoe, uh, thanks so much. Appreciate it. We will Thank be. You our final segment uh, and a final thought here on my state of mind students really a fluid situation going on no doubt we will pick up the education stuff in middle august so that we you know can follow this very bouncy ball for a start date that may or may not happen we'll see uh tomorrow night on the original shows this week a uh, tribute to John Lewis, congressman who passed away a couple of weeks ago. Um, some interesting dynamics there. In the meantime, we'll talk to you on the radio from 3 to 6 on WPRO. Thank you so much for tuning in. Have a great night.